everybody. Welcome to Global R&D of April 23. Thanks everybody for joining us today. And today we'll have like four updates and four demos for you. The first demo will be on the next steps of in the area of SNS. The second update will be uh, on CKBTC, where we are and what the next steps are. Then, uh, I mean, everybody claims to be green, but actually uh, you will see that the intercomputer is actually way greener than everybody else. And uh, Ashling will provide proof of that. Then we'll talk about something I'm actually personally very excited about, our co collaboration with Sama. And hopefully like after the presentation by Victor, you all will be equally exciting about, excited about that. Then uh, we'll move over to the demos, where the first demo will be from the community by Sig Dao. I'm very much looking forward to that one. Then Thomas will present the exchange rate canister, and Bjorn will talk about uh, what it does mean when we use those exchange rates uh, or the exchange rates canister in conjunction with the NNS. And then finally, Jason will uh, demonstrate the feedback board that his team has built. So let's uh, move over. I mean, it has been a while uh, since the open chat is a DAO now, and I'm very happy to see how it operates and uh, how proposals are submitted, getting executed. Chat tokens are trading uh, successfully on some of uh, the DEXs on the internet computer. But actually, I mean, we want to have more, right? I mean, uh, we want to have many, many SNSs and so on and so forth. So Pete, tell us uh, what is coming our way here. Hi, everyone. I'm Pete. I'm head of product here at Definity. And I, as Jan mentioned, I want to give you a quick update on the SNS project, which, as you know, is one of our most important initiatives. So I'm going to quickly give you an update on some of the developments in our already launched SNSs, uh, some changes planned for the SNS launchpad, and a heads up on the future SNS launches. So firstly, a quick reminder that the Internet Computer Dashboard has an SNS section on it now. Uh, where you can deep dive on all the launched SNSs with respect to how the governance is set up, the neurons, the proposals, and also the ledger activity. Um, and as you can see, there's been quite a bit of activity on our already launched SNSs. Open Chat has now voted on over 130 proposals, and there's been more than 60,000 token transfers on, on their ledger, their, their chat ledger. Um, whilst our first SNS DAO, SNS1, has also voted on about 45 proposals and uh, and seen 146,000 token transfers, which has uh, burnt almost one and a half tokens of its fixed supply. Next slide. Um, with both SNSs, there's been some recent interesting developments. On the Open Chat side, Open Chat launched a feature which allows uh, gated a neuron gated chat groups to be created. Uh, this means chat groups can be created which are restricted to those with a vested interest in SNS governance um, and improving maybe the quality of some of those uh, those groups. Um, and on the SNS one side, um, excitingly, the community has risen to the challenge of building something for this DAO. Um, ICB Coins is a, a project to build a dashboard which tracks the performance of tokens launched on the IC, a sort of on-chain version of CoinMarketCap. Um, the project and the DAO is going through the process of making this controlled by the SNS1. Next slide. Moving on to some of the changes being proposed for the SNS launch pad. The, the first change I want to highlight is what we, what's been called uh, the one proposal change. Um, when Open Chat's SNS was launched, you may have noticed that there were actually two NNS proposals and a manual process of initializing the SNS canisters in between. Um, the first proposal was to grant permission to a principal to install those initialized canisters, whilst the second proposal was the main proposal to run the swap, which is, if successful, would have result, which results in a fully functional SNS DAO being created. In the new world, it's proposed to reduce this to a single NNS proposal, which, if accepted, will automate all the subsequent steps, initializing the SNS canisters, running the swap, and then creating the actual SNS at the end. Um, this should greatly simplify the end-to-end -end process, making it easier for both projects and NNS users to understand. Next slide. The second chain I, change I want to talk about is like geo restrictions. Um, many projects have asked us to be able to exclude certain countries, uh, principally the US, uh, for various reasons, um, from participating in SNS launches. 
Um, as a decentralized permissionless blockchain, it's worth reminding everyone that it's not really possible to do this in a bulletproof way. Um, so what we're proposing uh, is to allow projects to encode geo preferences and that the various launchpad UIs can choose to implement some kind of enforcement or warnings as they see fit. Um, and it's also at this point, I'd like to call out, it's great to see that there are wallets beyond the NNS front end DAP implementing launchpad support. Um, IC Dex, um, or IC Lighthouse, sorry, launched their UI for the um, prior to the OpenChat launch. And it was, uh, it was great to see that for the OpenChat launch. Uh, Funded and Plug are planning to support the launchpad, um, uh, launchpad 2 soon. Next slide. But the question many of you have is what, what SNSs are coming next? Um, so it's super exciting to see a range of projects have announced that they're planning to launch SNS DAOs for their projects soon. Um, and I would encourage you all to scan the QR codes on the screen. It's a bit busy, I know. Um, and check out and familiarize yourself with all these fantastic projects that are um, coming down the pipeline. Uh, next slide. And lastly, quite a few of the community have been asking how Definity will uh, vote on the NNS proposals to create uh, new SNSs. Um, and the foundation recently published some guidelines on how we plan to vote on these proposals. Um, you can scan the QR code for um, more details. Um, but at a high level, um, Definity will vote, uh, but later in the voting period. Um, so individuals following Definity have the opportunity to vote themselves before we vote. Um, uh, Definity is also, uh, Definity is not planning to actually evaluate the viability of the project itself, um, but Definity will evaluate uh, some of the SNS parameters proposed and the processes that projects go through. And this is to help uh, guide SNS projects towards, uh, over time, some minimal standards and to prevent spam as we go forward. With that, um, uh, I'm super excited and looking forward to uh, the SNS is coming down the pipeline and, and back to Jan. Thank you, Pete. This is very cool. I mean, as you sure are all aware, CKBTC is operational now. And probably many of you are checking daily how many Bitcoin now there are on the internet computer and then looking at that graph. Uh, but we are far from finished here. This is really just a start. So Manu, tell us more. What is coming? What can we expect? Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Manu. I'm a director of engineering at Definity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so last month, uh, I also spoke about uh, in, in the previous Public Global R&D, I spoke about CKBTC and all the, the KYT challenges that we were at the time discussing with the community. Um, as a result of that, uh, Definity submitted three NNS proposals that were adopted on April 3rd, um, which installed this Chainalysis KYT canister and added a key provider and upgraded the CKBTC Minter canister to make use of that. And as a result of this, um, this fully uh, enabled CKBTC meaning that uh, since those proposals passed, anybody can convert Bitcoin into CKBTC by sending native Bitcoin to a Bitcoin address controlled by the CKBTC canisters and getting CKBTC in return. Um, now when the user has CKBTC, they can make very fast and uh, uh, low fee transactions uh, uh, on the internet computer using CKBTC. And then anybody that has CKBTC can send it to the CKBTC minter to redeem it for native Bitcoin. So they can ask to get the underlying Bitcoin back. Um, next slide, please. So since this has been enabled, um, we saw a, a, a significant growth in, in the amount of uh, uh, CKBTC in circulation. So uh, this morning um, we had 59 CKBTC in circulation, meaning that already people locked up, I think something like 1.7 million USD in, in, into this. Um, and I mean, it's very exciting to see that that this is increasing quite rapidly. So um, I think that's a very good trend. Next slide, please. So I just want to give a very quick overview of what you now can do and how, how you use all of this. Um, so as a first step, many people ask, OK, how can I actually now get CKBTC? And one option is to convert it yourself now. So you can take the Bitcoin that you might have and um, uh, convert it into CKBTC. There's, uh, I think, three main options for this. You can use the um, uh, the, the the front end by IC Lighthouse to to, to do this. Uh, ICP Swap also has a front end the, for this to to send your Bitcoin and redeem uh, and obtain CKBTC. 
Um, and a, a third option uh, is using the command line, using DFX directly uh, to talk to the canisters. Uh, this is a bit less user-friendly. Um, I see in the chat that I might've missed some. I, uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, a different way to obtain uh, CKBTC is uh, that you can buy it on a DEX. So I see DEX, uh, the, the order book DEX that I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, has a trading pair CKBTC ICP, so uh, you can you can trade there and, and buy CKBTC with your ICP or vice versa. And ICP Swap and Sonic uh, both have swaps enabled um, using liquidity pools. And this is also something that if you uh, if you have CKBTC, you can provide liquidity to those pools, and I think also earn some rewards. So that might be might be uh, interesting to do. Next slide, please. Uh, and then some other fun use cases uh, that I just wanted to uh, mention. So uh, Discover already supports tipping in, in CKBTC. So I put a screenshot here where I tip 50 Satoshi on a Discover post. Um, and in open chat, you can send, uh, uh, as a chat message, you can send CKBTC around. Um, and also uh, fundraising and investing is possible in CKBTC uh, on, on funded. Um, uh, next slide, please. So these are all, all um, a lot of exciting things already that we see today. Um, we're not done yet. And I think I'm mainly hoping to see more and more cool community build apps that, that use CKBTC and, and, and uh, uh, make it more and more interesting to have and use CKBTC. Uh, so I hope many of you here are, are building cool projects. And uh, Definity is also not done yet. So we plan to work on and submit proposals for things like imp improving the fee bookkeeping in the CKBTC Minter, uh, make that conversion flow simpler. Um, we have this uh, CKBTC Minter dashboard that shows all this transparency and shows that bit, that CKBTC is back to one-to-one -one by Bitcoin. Um, I added a, a link here, a QR code. Uh, that, that needs a lot of improvement that we're planning to work on. Um, as you may know, we now work with one KYT provider, Chainalysis. Um, we will propose to, to make that into multiple. So there is some fault tolerance there. Uh, the NNS front end um, uh, should of course also at some point support the conversion between CKBTC and BTC, which it doesn't do yet today. Um, and then overall, we just um, we will try to help foster CKBTC adoption and awareness, uh, which will be an ongoing effort. Um, yeah, so lots of exciting news in the past month about CKBTC and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Manu. Yeah, having talked about Bitcoin, right? And, and I guess uh, one reason why I am at Definity is because I'm I'm very upset about Bitcoin, all the energy it uses, and like other blockchain, how they use energy and uh, are not green. And uh, like a standard computer lives on the northern hemisphere, and now in April, the world outside becomes green and, and nice. Uh, I guess it's a good reminder to remind ourselves we have to take care of the environment. And one mission, of course, of the internet computer is also to build uh, the blockchain in a way that is energy efficient, that, that doesn't waste the energy left and right. And so I'm very happy to have Ashling today presenting us how well we have done already and, and what, our, what we can do to be even better in this area. Ashling, please. Thanks very much, Jan, for the introduction. As he said, I'm Ashling. I'm a researcher here at Divinity. I focus on privacy, sustainability, and anything I can do to reduce the harms of tech on people and the world in general. So yeah, let's see how uh, we are doing in that front so far. So next slide, please. Um, so I guess over the past year, there has been a lot of talk about sustainability. Um, we had some motion proposals from the community. We had some uh, measurements done before. There were reports released last year. Here, I wanted to give a little bit of an update of what we've been doing since so over the past six months or so. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a view of where we stand at the moment and where we plan to go in the future. And so... We kind of wanted to take this moment to celebrate one year of work. So um, last weekend was Earth Day 2023, and this whole project kind of kicked off on Earth Day 2022. So it's very nice to actually do a full kind of uh, turn around the sun and see see how far we've come. So since we last talked and on global R&D, there are two main milestones reached. One is that 
we now have the first real-time data stream coming through. So uh, some of the nodes are reporting the real-time data of their energy consumption. So you can track that. I'll put the link in the uh, chat in a minute. And Carbon Crowd, so our partner and kind of big inspiration for sustainability and decarbonization in tech, um, released their sustainability dashboard. So if we go to the next slide, you can see a preview of that. Um, and as Kyle mentioned on Twitter, if you haven't spent five minutes twirling this globe, uh, you're not doing it right. So I urge you to scan the QR code there, take a look at the dashboard, twirl the globe, um, see where it's green at the moment, and also keep an eye over time. You'll see that some, I mean, the colors change, obviously. It's real time. So everything that you see here is actually at the moment how the energy consumption is. Uh, if you check it in the morning, some places look different. If you check it in the evening, some other places look different. You can click in the left side through the nodes and see, yeah, like you can see patterns. We are still early and uh, working on this has opened a whole like bunch of avenues to continue work. So as I mentioned, we now have a, rep a representative samples of nodes reporting their data. So we have at least one in every subnet of the IC reporting how much energy they're consuming every minute. Um, in the coming months, we hope to get all nodes. So we really have like a full, full picture and full transparency of what is going on and what is being consumed on the internet computer minute by minute. But beyond this, uh, it, the conversation gets a little bit tricky because we talk about energy consumption, we talk about carbon footprints, the Carbon Crowd guys have a methodology for computing the carbon footprint, and this has been verified by FinGreen AI. But at the same time, there are lots of other projects doing similar kind of work, but with different results and different uh, metrics and different ways of actually measuring these things and reporting them and discussing them. And so there can be quite a lot of confusion amongst us in the industry and also people who want to use and make decisions about these projects and these networks. And so for one other thing that we really want to work on is to try to have more kind of industry standard metrics. Um, I give one example here, thinking about a transaction. We all talk about transaction, but one question is, is it better to mention maybe consumption per instruction, for example, because instructions are something that are maybe slightly more comparable across uh, networks. Another one is scope, so expanding the scope to scope three. And this is the normal for traditional tech, and this is usually what is needed for to comply with some regulation when it exists. And for this, we need to define end-to-end -end use cases, which should be an industry-wide discussion as well. Um, and beyond this, there's kind of policy questions like, okay, so once regulation does come, how can we comply with that? So there's really a lot of work to do. And this, I think, is a snapshot of what we envision to happen over the coming year. So next slide, please. Um, another big thing that happened last week is that the proof of, initi proof of green initiative went live. And for me, this is all about, for us, or like for the IC community in general, this is all about applying the blockchain principles that we know and love to the sustainability conversation. We care about transparency, we care about openness, we care about data availability. And so we just want to apply those principles to this sustainability conversation and to whatever we report. And so maybe you saw last week, there was a lot of communication about this. And we also had some of our industry partners in the office to discuss the next steps and uh, outline what we should do next as a community. So if we go to the last slide, maybe I give you a quick overview of what actually Proof of Green is. So it's this collaborative initiative to develop open source trustless standards for emission measurements. This is it, like, and this simply does not exist at the moment. It's a challenge to others to be more transparent. So now that we are reporting live data and we show you uh, um, the real-time carbon footprint, can we get everybody else to do this? Are they able to do this? Um, but it's an opportunity also for everyone to come together to define common metrics and uh, it's a potential for node providers to be recognized for good behavior, for greener behavior, and rewarded, and uh, ultimately to comply with regulation when it happens. Um, but ultimately, the mission of the Proof of Green initiative is to bring together industry to decarbonize crypto. 
You can scan the QR code there to register interest if you want to join or for more information. Thanks very much. And I hand it back to Jan. Thank you, Ashley. So great to see this. Uh, we're coming to another uh, topic that is also very dear to my heart, which is privacy and uh, helping protect uh, people's privacy. Now, blockchain is known for providing transparency, and because many people believe that keeping da data yet usable on a blockchain world is, is not possible. Now, it turns out that on the inner computer blockchain, actually, one can use uh, cryptography to bridge this gap. And uh, in fact, uh, the inner computer is the only blockchain where this can be done in a meaningful way. Victor, please enlighten us. Okay, yeah, I'm Victor Shoup. I'm a researcher at Definity. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about a, collab a collaboration between Definity and Zama, a research collaboration. So the first question is, what is Zama? For those of you who don't know. Um, well, it's a company that's focused on developing uh, FHE technology. So FHE stands for fully homomorphic encryption. And uh, so then the question is, what is FHE? Um, well, at a super high level, it enables computation on encrypted data. In a little bit more detail, and this is the only kind of math I'll be presenting here, is that it, it works as follows. So we can have a bunch of users, Alice, Bob, and other folks who encrypt cipher or encrypt uh, messages. So they encrypt M1, they get a ciphertext C1, somebody else might encrypt M2 and get a ciphertext C2. These ciphertext can be given to another party, Homer, who can uh, homomorphically compute on these ciphertext. So Homer just has the ciphertext C1, C2, and so on. And he has some function that he wants to compute F. And he applies a, a special algorithm eval to this data. And what he gets out is an encryption of the plain text, which is F evaluated M1, M2, and so on. And he does all this without having any clue as to what the plain texts are. He just has the ciphertext and, and this is all he knows. Later, another party, Dave, who has the secret key that allows for decryption, can take such a ciphertext like C, decrypt it and get the, well, this value. So he gets F evaluated at M1, M2 and so on. And this is all that Dave gets, right? So he doesn't learn what is M1 or M2. He just learns some function of this data. So FHE has a very long history. It was first proposed in 1978, uh, first solution in 2008, and there's been a lot of progress since then. I, in fact, in, before joining uh, Definity, worked at IBM on, a, on an FHE project there. So why FHE? Well, as Jan already mentioned, it's one way of enabling privacy on a blockchain. So blockchains like Bitcoin uh, really offer no privacy at all. All the transactions are recorded on a very public ledger. Um, what's the state of the art today on the internet computer in terms of privacy? Well, today, privacy essentially relies on uh, nodes behaving in a non-corrupt way. There's a lot more to it than that. It's a bit more nuanced, but that's essentially where we're at today. In the near future, uh, and I don't want to define what means near, uh, where we want to improve the situation by uh, enhancing our nodes with trusted execution environments like AMD, SEV. Even if we do that, uh, there's still some limitations with that. It's well known that uh, these trusted execution environments suffer from a seemingly endless uh, barrage of side channel attacks. Uh, and then on top of that, even if those are solved, there are still some trust issues in terms of uh, who you really have to trust to make sure that uh, these trusted execution environments are really trustworthy. Um, so also in the near future, without putting a, uh, a date to it, we hope to uh, uh, do something with threshold key derivation. Um, this would enable users to store and retrieve and encrypted data on the internet computer with uh, very convenient key management. Um, but it doesn't actually enable computation on encrypted data. Um, somewhere in the grand and glorious future, at the end of this uh, long research project, uh, we hope to enable arbitrary computation on encrypted data. And FHE is one of actually a couple of different ways you might do this, but it's a very promising technology that will enable this functionality. Once we get there, what will you be able to do? Uh, well, uh, so there's a number of applications you could build on the internet 
computer using this technology. One would be, for example, um, confidential token transfers. So you could either hide the balance and or the recipient of a token transfer. Another might be sealed bid auctions or many related kind of uh, transactional um, activities like dark pools and confidential DEXs. Um, another would be privacy preserving data mining. So for example, you might have uh, uh, aggregation of, of, of user data like financial or, or medical records that uh, can be mined to obtain uh, aggregate data but doesn't reveal uh, um, uh, information about individuals. Another kind of hot topic is AI these days, and uh, an, an area for exploration there is privacy preserving AI. So how to submit uh, questions to chat GPT without actually letting chat GPT know what questions you're actually uh, answering or how to enhance chat GPT with uh, uh, data sets uh, without publishing to the whole world um, potentially sensitive data. And also many on-chain games that rely on uh, partial information. Um, why is the internet computer very well suited to exploit this technology? Well, for two reasons. One is, um, two main reasons. One is that uh, the internet computer architecture already provides a very rich execution environment, and it should be conceivably pretty straightforward to extend this to allow uh, dApps to compute on encrypted data as well as ordinary data. Um, a second main reason is that um, the internet computer already today supports threshold cryptography in the form of chain key cryptography. This includes threshold BLS, threshold ECDSA. And as it turns out, kind of um, uh, a technical challenge involved in deploying FHE is that we'll need to provide a functionality that allows us to threshold decrypt uh, FHE ciphertext. So we're just getting started on this um, collaboration. Um, we've initiated a joint kind of exploratory research project, so we're not promising any products in the next uh, few months. Um, a key focus of this initial research will be on threshold FHE decryption. And it's a bit challenging because we need to be compatible with both the IC architecture and with Zama's uh, FHE algorithms. Uh, and we finished very preliminary step in this project in the last few months. Uh, this is a new protocol for what's called asynchronous verifiable secret sharing. Um, this is, uh, even though it maybe sounds esoteric, it's actually a, an essential building block uh, for almost any approach you might want to take for a threshold FHE decryption. And we have a research paper hot off the press uh, written by myself and Nigel Smart, who's uh, associated with Zama. Um, and you can download it from the uh, IECR, IACR ePrint server. And that's it. Thank you, Victor. So happy to see how the ICP spearheads the area here once more. So we've talked about SNSS, and which is just like, like a means to uh, create a DAO for uh, services on the internet computer. But of course, the concept of a DAO is much, much larger. And indeed, like a DAO or decentralized anonymous organization will be a way how people routinely will organize a group of people in the future. And I'm very happy to have Daniel from SIGDAO here today who will uh, show us how this can be done in like uh, a nice way. So please, Daniel, the floor is yours. So we are SIGDAO and we're trying to make crypto fun. What does that mean? To me, crypto fun means more DAOs, more tokens, more weird experimental software that won't necessarily make money, but it's out there and it's interesting, right? And that's sort of my, my persona that I'm trying to pursue with this technology. Uh, so our mission is to make a DAO easy to customize, easy to deploy, and make it easy for you to attach your application to that DAO, right? I, I want to get people, I want developers to spend time working on their application, and then the DAO be like something that you do extra to deploy it that you don't really have to spend that much time on, right? So I'm just going to jump straight into the, the demo. So this right here is a MUI theme editor. MUI is just a standard way to, you know, create your application with components on, on React. So 
I am going to grab this and I'm going to copy this. And what this is doing is it's setting uh, the look and feel of the DAO. So we just copied this code. Normally, you would go in here and edit stuff, but I'm going to spare you the pain of that because that can take a really long time. So we copy pasted that. We can put that here like this. Remove this up here. And then uh, every DAO has an about page, right? You need to know their what they're doing, what they're all about, who the team is, whatever. There's this file called aboutpage.md. And I just have this chat GPT description over here. We're going to copy it real quick because, again, you don't want to watch me write a description. Bam. And then I'm going to rename the DAO, right? So I'm making a Definity demo. So let's call it uh, Definity is cool. And the symbol is going to be actually, let's do uh, ICP is cool. And the symbol is going to be IIC, right? Uh, the token, because every DAO has a token, will have eight decimals. Transaction fees will be zero. Proposal duration will be 61 seconds. It's going to cost one token to create a proposal because, you know, eight decimals, eight decimals of one. Three million initial supply, one million for airdrop amount because this has an airdrop functionality coded so that you can airdrop people from other communities. Distributions and exchange rates. This is for you to do your token sale because uh, you know you, most of these DAOs have to raise money. But I also added XTC. So if you wanted to, you could release your token and have people donate cycles. Because if you don't really need money, you just want your application to last a very long time. Maybe you just want people to give you cycles for your application. Uh, then we have stake duration because it's a DAO. You have to stake your tokens to vote, and that's where your token power comes from. And custodian is the initial admin for the DAO because it's not permissionless at first, right? So let's say you did those three things. We're going to do DFX, deploy, and your password. And what is this doing? It is now building everything you need for a DAO. And while that's happening, let's talk about the code. I am not a Rust developer. I'm not a Motoko developer. I am a TypeScript and Java developer. And I'm, I'm not used to how when you code in Motoko or Rust, you have to use the CLI a lot. You have to download a lot of dependencies. I'm not used to that. I, I like to make things as easy as possible, as less confusing as possible. I don't want to use the CLI. So in order to build this, I decided to use... Uh, TypeScript and ASL. So all of this was built in ASL. So any developer that wants to use this or edit it or customize it, and it's all open source, all they need to know is TypeScript. And because they're front-end developers, they should be able to easily do the back-end as well. So that's the idea. And I'm, I'm also an influencer, and I will be creating a lot of um, videos and tutorials on how to create your own down the internet computer. And it'll all be in TypeScript. And I'm hoping, because my goal is to grow the ecosystem. So the DAO should be just about built. It's installing the code right now. And there it is. So now we can go over here. And uh, the DAO should be, let me refresh this, because this is a different page. And this is what it looks like. And refresh, and let's connect our plug wallet. And this is your DAO. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to click this. Because I'm a custodian, I'm an admin, I can pin, mint tokens because I need tokens in order to interact with the DAO, right? So I'm going to mint tokens real quick. And because I want voting power, I'm going to stake tokens real quick. And that should take a little bit because, you know, there you go. So I stake 10 tokens. And then I, I didn't build a DAO, right? I built an application. So I'm going to create a proposal. No, not a treasury proposal, a Wesson proposal install an application on the DAO. This is a cool DAO, uh, cool application. And then I'm going to grab a WASM and put it right there and submit. And that, if the demo gods are nice to me, should insufficient cycles. Oh, hold on. I, but my DAO, so, the way that it works is that the DAO cycles are shared onto it, and it only has three trillion cycles, so I have to fabricate some cycles real quick. Sorry about that. And that should have enough cycles now. 
and that should create the proposal. There we go. So now we have a proposal to install an application on the DAO, and we're going to vote yes on that. And I put 61 seconds, but it works on a timer, so it's going to take a little bit longer than a minute to do it. And while that's happening, let's go back to the slides. So it's going to be the first. This I'm going to be releasing a DAO in the next coming weeks called Nonprofit DAO, and that's going to be the first of many DAOs uh, coming out of this technology, hopefully. Um, Things that I want to add as features to SIG DAO is I want to be able to wrap ordinals, Bitcoin ordinals onto tokens so that the ordinal community can create DAOs within the internet computer community. I also want to be able to create Ethereum token DAOs. I want to be able to have people wrap their Ethereum tokens so existing Ethereum tokens can just create a DAO on the internet computer. Uh, and then I want to create a CLI deploy. The idea would be that you wouldn't have to pull down code and edit it, right? You should be able to do just to your project, add a config file, a theme file, and an about file, and then do CLI deploy, and then your stuff should be there. And then you should be able to CLI deploy your application onto the DAO as a proposal. You shouldn't you shouldn't have to edit the code. That's stuff that you need to do. And then I also want to create a coordinator DAO. So all of these DAOs are going to be controlled by people, but that's wrong, right? DAO should be permissionless. So I should be able to, once I'm done with my DAO, once I want to hand it to the community, deploy my DAO onto another DAO and have it control it. So the coordinator DAO will control all of the DAOs created within this. Uh, and those are the things that we want to add as features going forward. And hopefully, I think I talked really fast, so the proposal is probably not done yet. Let's refresh. Oh, it is done. So now you're going to go up here. And in DAO balances, if you remember, there used to be three. And now a cool application is there. We can click on it. We can see that it has been installed. Uh, and then if you have a front end, you would also create a proposal for that. Uh, and yeah, the DAO controls that. And that's that's pretty much it. You can also delete the WASM proposal. Um, yeah, that's, that's the end of, of SIG DAO. If you have any questions, I will be on the chat uh, and I will answer all questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. So nice to see this. Um, we have talked about the NNS canisters, uh, different NNS canisters quite a bit, but like one canisters that we hardly ever talked about is the uh, exchange rate canisters. Uh, so Please, Thomas, uh, put some limelight on it. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm Thomas, researcher at Definity, and I'd like to introduce the exchange rate canister, which is a new piece of functionality available on the internet computer. So it is a canister that makes heavy use of HTTPS outcalls, uh, as shown in this figure. Uh, HTTPS outcalls make it possible for canisters to interact with a regular web servers, uh, which is a, a pretty unique and powerful feature on the internet computer. As most of you probably know, on other blockchains, um, you'd have to use external Oracle services to uh, get Web2 data into your smart contracts. So the exchange rate canister is, um, is an example of a price Oracle that uh, lives entirely on chain and is built only using HTTPS outcalls. And it provides essentially any, any pay, uh, an exchange rate for any pair of assets that are supported by uh, the data sources that it interacts with. And that is, of course, a very useful feature for a range of applications, including DeFi applications, but also the NNS itself uh, is going to use it because the cycle minting canister uh, always requires an up-to-date ICP XDR rate. And one more thing, yeah, I'd like to mention here, if you have your token and you want to integrate that with a state-of-the-art Oracle service, that can be a, a big hassle, actually. It can be quite time-consuming and uh, also pretty expensive. And here, as soon as your token is listed on one of the major exchanges, the exchange rate canister will be able to return exchange rate exchange rates for this token right away which i think is pretty cool um yeah if you want to learn more about the exchange rate canister there's a link to the wiki page uh, in the bottom right corner next slide please yeah here i'd like to 
point out that the Exchanger canister has a very simple interface, essentially consisting of a single endpoint. So as you can see here, we, a canister has to send an exchange rate request to the exchange rate canister uh, containing a base asset and a quote asset and uh, potentially also a timestamp if you're interested in historic rates. Uh, if you leave it empty, you'll simply get the most recent data. And when you get a response, uh, the result, if all goes well, will contain an exchange rate, uh, which uh, contains, again, the base asset, quote asset, also populate a timestamp, and of course, the rate that you requested, and also some metadata, for example, the number of sources uh, that uh, it sent the request to, and also the number of rates it received, and so on. Next slide, please. Yeah, here you can see the exchange rate canister exposes its own dashboard. Again, uh, if you want to take a closer look, there's a link uh, in the bottom right. Uh, it provides, provides metadata about the exchange rate canister as well as information about uh, the Forex collection process and uh, current or, or the most recent requests. Next slide, please. Yeah, and finally here you can see a um, kind of demo interaction with the exchange rate canister. So I deployed my own canister, which exposes a very simple get exchange rate uh, a function. It uh, only accepts a base asset symbol and returns the rate with respect to USD. And of course, under the hood, this canister just calls the exchange rate canister to get the, uh, the exchange rate. And as you can see in the example here, I use uh, Bitcoin, so the BTC symbol as an example. Um, in the lower right corner, you see the rate that it returned. And for comparison, on the right, you see uh, the rate on CoinMarketCap at pretty much the same time. So you can see that the rate is, is very accurate. That is uh, all I wanted to show. And I'll hand over now to Gern, who will tell us a bit about the implications for the NNS. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. This is um, Björn, um, the social affinity focusing on uh, governance and tokenomics. Yeah, so um, as Thomas said, like the um, this exchange rate canister is a very cool feature uh, and it can be used to, um, uh, to, to simplify actually the, the NNS, in particular uh, to remove exchange rate proposals. Overall idea is to um, replace the current existing proposal based uh, mechanism, which is depicted on this slide. So um, you see that um, every 10 minutes, um, a proposal for updating the ICP XDR exchange rate is submitted to the governance canister. Then um, once that is settled, the governance canister then updates the uh, ex exchange rate uh, in, in the cycles minting canister. And that canister is then relevant um, if you want to top up uh, your 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 cycles in a, another in another canister, reverting ITP and you know receiving cycles. Um, so now um, we can do that now simpler. As you can see on the next slide. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, we can use exchange rate canister, uh, and so the cycles minting canister can directly talk to it. I query on a periodic basis. Uh, I think it's foreseen now to do that every five minutes. The ICP XDR exchange rate, get it back. And so there are no proposals needed uh, to fulfill uh, that, that action. So um, that's great. It's a simplified uh, and fully automated process completely on chain. Now, it doesn't stop here. So if you go to the next slide, uh, it does has some implications on the NS voting and rewards. Uh, so if you look at the left hand side, currently uh, we processed 144 exchange rate proposals a day. And in addition to that, roughly zero to 15 other kind of proposals. And now, once um, this change goes live, which is planned uh, next week, the um, these 104 exchange rate proposals will go away. Uh, and yeah, that's of course a significant change uh, in the composition and a number of proposals being processed. And um, hence, a review was done, uh, leading to two um, further actions here. The first one is about spam prevention. Um, this change going live as is would have increased the financial incentive to su submit spam proposals. Uh, and hence, um, uh, a community proposal was actually implemented and released already uh, in March of this year to address that point. A second action that was triggered is like uh, 
the rollover of voting rewards, which I'll explain uh, on the next slide, please. So, um, so if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, so currently, as I mentioned, you know, every 10 minutes, so in particular also like every day, proposals are submitted and, uh, and, and settled. Uh, and um, that means now that um, an every day, a so-called voting reward event takes place. So that means if you look at the little picture on the bottom left side, uh, for every uh, day of the week, uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, voting rewards in maturity is determined and then distributed to uh, neurons that voted on that particular day. Now, if you go to the right-hand side, now this picture here, so um, in the new situation, um, removing the exchange rate proposals, we might have days without proposals settling, so particular following a weekend. So if you look at the picture on the top bottom right, uh, so let's assume on the preceding uh, Saturday, Sunday, nobody submitted a proposal and further assume that uh, voting in the proposal takes roughly three days, uh, would mean that on Tuesday and Wednesday, no proposal would settle and hence it, no reward event could take place. Uh, there was, there's no mean to dispute rewards on that particular day. So the question now is that uh, these are two light blue bars that you see in the picture, what happens with the voting reports, which are available on those days? And the answer to that is on the next slide. Uh, essentially, it's very easy, like we essentially roll this over. So that means like uh, uh, on, on the following day, say let's say Thursday, uh, we um, have again proposed settling. So like um, for the whole of Thursday, all proposals that settle on that day are collected. And then a reward event is triggered. And that reward event then distributes the rewards linked to Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So no reward events are missed. Oh no, sorry, no, no uh, uh, rewards on this. Now, next, next and last slide, we see um, what does it mean for you? Well, essentially, it means the rollover ensures that uh, you as a, you know, somebody who votes with this neuron, do, do not miss any rewards. Uh, and we can also uh, check the last maturity distribution in the NNS step, as you can see in the screen, in screenshot, where like the date of the last distribution is given. And so if that date is more than one day in the past, then a rollover is currently taking place. All right, that's all from my side. Back to you, Jan. Thank you, Björn. So the making the life of developers on ICP as easy as possible is a big part of our mission at the Definity Foundation. And now where we are developers ourselves, we need uh, everybody's feedback uh, to do a better job here. And so for that, we have built a feedback, uh, feedback board. And Jason, tell us how developers can give us feedback. Thank you, Jan. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jason, and I'm part of the SDK and Matoko teams here at Definity. Um, I'd like to present to you the feedback board, which we launched today. Um, this is one result of our effort to improve developer experience. Uh, next slide, please. So what is it? Um, simply put, the feedback board is a DAP running on the IC that allows you to request functionality, report bugs, and upvote items uh, that you care about that have been reported by others in the developer community. Uh, next slide, please. So why do it? Um, to give you a bit of background, we recently held a small focus group, um, and our goal was to think about how we can improve and better prioritize developer experience of the internet computer platform. Um, here are our takeaways. A, our objective is to deliver the best developer experience possible to continuously improve and remove obstacles from that journey of ideation to launch on the IC. Um, of course, with ease and joy. B, we need to ascertain what the majority of developers need right now. Um, and the community has asked for some time to have a single place to provide this level of input. So we understand that for us, uh, this input helps prioritize what we work on um, to maximize the value developers get out of the IC. So up to now, um, the community did not have an effective organized channel. You know, discussions are, are sort of scattered across the forum, GitHub, Discord, Twitter, um, et cetera. One of these discussions actually landing on our roadmap boils down to timing, 
luck or um, incessant shouting. So we need a way to collect feedback and understand what is most important to you. Uh, next slide, please. Introducing the feedback board. So this is a place for you as developers to request the features and functionality you want to see land. Um, it allows you to describe what you want and submit that directly to us. Other members of the, de the developer community can see what you've added uh, and they can upvote if they want to see that land too. Uh, what we've done on our side is we've established an internal developer experience working group um, whose mission is to triage these issues and uh, ultimately address them. Uh, to bring them to life in the, in the tools and libraries and um, uh, development flows, workflows that you, you uh, use every single day. So now instead of scattering feedback across a multitude of channels, you'll have a single place to provide your wish list and influence the features we focus uh, on more directly. Um, we'll be focusing mostly on developer experience related work items that can be accomplished in the short to medium term. Um, so note that this is not replacing NNS motion proposals, of course, but it's still an effective way to influence our roadmap on big ticket items as well. Um, and by the way, it's 100% on-chain Matoko and deployed on the IC, and we've open sourced the code so you can use it as an example template. Um, we think it, it, it makes a pretty good one. And big thank you to, to Ryan Vandersmith and Matthew Hammer for bringing this to life. Um, so now I'll share my screen and I'll, I'll walk you through it. The first thing to do is uh, visit dx.internetcomputer.org. You can see the URL there. And what you'll see when you land here is this list uh, of items that are currently being considered. Um, you can browse through this list. You can read through the descriptions, engage in the discussions if there's an associated forum link. Um, and if you care about this issue, you can upvote it. So for example, um, we have this new method uh, at the system API level to determine if a caller is a controller. Um, I really want to see this uh, land and I want to see this land soon. So I'm gonna upvote it. And when I do, um, of course, as you submit your upvote, as the community submits their votes, um, the items with the highest votes are going to, to percolate up to the top. Um, you can see that by sorting through uh, uh, by votes, the default sort will be by activity, so you can kind of see what uh, what is being voted on or discussed or or, or brought up more uh, in, most recently. But you can also change this view to sort on votes, and you'll see the the, the most voted on features um, up at the top. Now, if you don't see the issue that you're looking for, uh, you can submit your own. Um, all you have to do is uh, log in with your internet identity or NFID. I'm already logged in here, um, but um, it, it's very simple to, to log in. It'll take you to the, the uh, login flow that we're all familiar with and you'll land back here. And um, once you do, you can submit your own issue. Um, you can add a title, a description, add any relevant links uh, and tags to, to help aid in discovery. And then you can submit it. And you know, once you do, um, our team will review it, approve it, and it will show up then on this browse page and others can, can uh, view it as well. So when our working group then meets uh, every two weeks, we'll triage the top issues and we'll start planning work. So great, uh, that's all I wanted to show you for the demo. Please try it out, it's available today. You can visit uh, dx.internetcomputer.org and you can start voting on the issues you want us to prioritize. Um, and if what you want isn't listed, submit your own issue. Uh, in the form of bug reports or requests for new functionality, we will review each and every submission. Um, and let me make it clear, it's our mission to make your experience using internet computer the best it can be. Um, and with that, thank you for listening and looking forward to your feedback. Uh, back to you, Jan. Thank you, Jason. So one more thing before we close for today. The uh, next uh, ICP hackathon is coming along and actually registr registration is live now. So please uh, register and join us for the next hackathon. This hackathon is about uh, Bitcoin, but all six Bitcoin. But also if you don't want to hack on Bitcoin, there's like a sidetrack, the blue sky track where like any submission is uh, allowed. The uh, There is about 20, 3k dollars of price and uh, we can also have uh, uh, win like a development grant for 60k usd here 
The workshop will be then starting end of May, last until June, and the submission deadline is like the 18th of June. So please uh, spread the word and, and join and get many people to join this hackathon. So that uh, concludes uh, Global R&D for April. And the next one will be end of May, the 31st of May. So see you all there. Have a good time until then. Thank you. Bye-bye.